Shelley attended Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, where she was the first female to graduate with a degree in manufacturing engineering. After graduation, she moved back to her home state of Michigan and landed her dream job as a manufacturing engineer to start off her 20 plus year career for Ford Motor Company. A few years into her engineering career, she decided to go back to school to get an MBA. Shelley has spent over 30 years serving in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and in her community. She has always enjoyed serving others. Shelley enjoys woodworking and has amassed a workshop of her dreams. She also enjoys being outside in the fresh air, trail riding in her ATV, and enjoying the Great Lakes, boating, and jet skiing. Shelley is happily married to her husband, Glenn. She is the stepmother of four children, grandmother of two, and adored aunt of many. I'm Tara McCausland. Welcome to the Still Rowing Podcast. And I'm so thrilled to have you here with me, Shelley. Thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I was so excited when you reached out to me. Shelley and I had an opportunity to speak on the phone a couple of weeks ago, and I got to hear more of Shelley's story. And I was just amazed at her strength and her resilience and her faith. Um, as my listeners know, we talk to people on this podcast who have been through some very hard things. In all of those cases, as I often say, the common denominator is, is great faith in Jesus Christ. And you have certainly demonstrated that. And so I hope that this message that you share, Shelley, can, can give hope uh, to those who feel like they're just in the trenches and like there's, there's no light. <laughs> so we'll just start off and I'm going to have you just tell us a bit about your family of origin and the challenges that you've faced in, in your youth. And my objective in sharing my story is exactly the same as yours, Tara, is to give people hope. But what I'm going to start off by saying and telling uh, is not going to sound hopeful. So hang on. <laughs> there, there's hope in this message. So just to, to start off, um, I'm going to give you guys like the, the very Cliff Notes version of my story, because uh, as I was telling you, Tara, um, I'm in the process of writing my memoir and it's, it's a 12, 12 hours of narration to tell my story. So I started in a, in a non-member home. I grew up at, actually as a devout Catholic, um, but my dad was a, a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde abusive alcoholic. Um, most of his um, abuse and rage was, was directed at my mother, but when you grow up with domestic violence, you, um, as a child, you internalize all that um, stress. No child that grows up in domestic violence comes out unscathed. It's, it's, it's definitely something that leads to PTSD and actually complex PTSD and major issues in life. People talk about what's the gateway drug for addicts. Well, the gate, there is no gateway drug. The gateway drug is trauma. And, um, and so I grew up with a lot of trauma with my, with my parents, because when I was 15, um, my alcoholic abusive father ended up murdering my mother and burning her house down. And um, it wasn't, he wasn't arrested right away. Um, I was, I was a sophomore in high school. It was October of my sophomore year. My sister was a senior and she was 17. And, and my dad, um, it's a long story that, that uh, uh, my dad and my mom got into a fight and um, he ended up killing her and, and burning the house down to cover, cover it up while my sister and I were at basketball practice he wasn't arrested right away. He, he wasn't even arrested until February of the following year. My sister and I had to live with my dad for two and a half years before his trial. Mm -hmm. So, um, even after my mother's murder, um, things got worse for, for my sister and I, we, we had to live with him. And then 
the abuse that he would take out on my mother, he started directing towards my sister. I mean, I had to prevent my dad from killing my sister at least one time um, in this time period. I was reading about my life in the newspaper, really, because I was a minor. So people weren't telling me what was going on. And, you know, you're the target of all the gossip in the school. I mean, talk about <laughs> what's going on is, is your, your, your dad's being charged with murder. And, and I lived in a very upscale suburban suburb of Detroit, like um, not the most posh, but mm -hmm. pretty upscale. I mean, we had a, a, a one acre lot with rolling hills and a stream in our backyard and, and all custom homes. Um, my dad actually designed and built our home. I helped build the home that my dad burned down. My dad designed it himself. And um, so there was a lot going on in my childhood, just in my own family of origin. And on top of that, um, I, um, because when, when you grow up in domestic violence, well, at least in my home, I was taught to not talk. So what would happen is, is my dad would, most of his rages and explosions would happen um, after a night of drinking. So like if my parents went to a wedding reception or, you know, it was the weekend or something like that. And so um, it would be the Friday or Saturday night a lot of the times. And then the next morning would be this big morning after breakfast where dad would be cooking Mm -hmm. um, eggs mm -hmm. and hash browns and sausage. And we're all to gather around the table and you say nothing, nothing right. happened. You just ignore. And so because I was trained from the very beginning to not speak up, it set me up to be the perfect victim for predators. So um, I was molested at, at four years old by an acquaintance of the family. And then at 11, um, we always um, had one big Christmas present every year. And when I turned 11, um, that, that year, our Christmas present for my sister and I was to go to Acapulco with my parents because they, they had been going for probably eight years at this point um, um, to the same resort the same week and, um, and with friends. And then like they met people um, that did the same thing that went to the same resort. So my parents took my sister and I on this vacation with them when I was 11. And I ended up getting molested multiple times by this man who was probably in his late fifties at the time. I, and um and I didn't say anything because I was trained. You don't mm -hmm. say anything. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so the, the, the same year that my mom was murdered three months before her murder, which was in July of 85, we went on another family vacation to England and my, my grandmother was born in Scotland. And so, um, we had family in England. So we went over there for the whole month of July. And we were at the end of the, the, the month, we were staying at some relative's house and, and my, mo my mom's cousins actually, and her sons were our age, my sister and I's age. And they said, hey, you know, can, can we all go out to this club? It was kind of like a, a teenager pre 20, you know, nightclub. And so my parents let us go. Well, I go and I end up getting raped at, um, there. And then four months after my mom's murder, my dad sends my sister and I back to um, Mexico. He was going to surprise us with this trip, but he got arrested right before the trip and couldn't leave the country. So he sent us with my older cousins and the guy that molested me when I was 11 ended up raping me when I was 15. So 
all of that trauma I carried from my youth and I had to, um, through my, the process of my life, unpack that. And that's just, those are just the big hitters. <laughs> those right. aren't, oh those aren't all the other things that happened. I had so many crazy things happen in this time period in my life. I could, I could go on and tell you story after story that would, you just shake your head at. I had devastating um, medical issues and injuries. And I mean, I spent two months of my senior year in a body cast for my back. I blew out my knee and had to have it reconstructed. So like all these things happened in, in this time period when I was a teenager. Hmm. So that's wow. the, that's the summary. <laughs> that, that's the reader's digest version yes. of Shelley's yes. incredibly difficult youth. My word, we can't judge other people's lives because so many people spend their lives on unpaved roads. They face bump after bump after bump. So often we, as an observer, we see people's lives again, like the reader's digest version, and we do not see the bumpy path that they have had to travel. And so uh, recognizing that so many of us have incredible trauma that goes unspoken. So very hard youth. Did you feel like during this time period that you could see God's hand in your life? What was your relationship with God like at this time? And um, even during this tumultuous period, did you feel like he was present in your life? Uh, absolutely. I, I did. I mean, I grew up, um, I mean, very devout Catholic. My, my, my mom's brother actually studied to become a priest. And like uh, my mom, my, uh, my uncle and, and my aunt, my mom's siblings, they all went to uh, 12 years of, of Catholic uh, schooling and they all went to Catholic universities. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And my, and my grandmother, um, literally volunteered for, um, the, uh, convent little sisters of the poor, like four days a week, <laughs> very devout Catholic family. And, um, I went to, I, my dad wasn't religious at all. When he would go on his tirades, he would completely belittle and tear apart, um, religion in general, um, he did come to church on Christmas and Easter with us, but it, um, this was um, this was my mom's thing, really. You know, we went to church on holy days, and my sister and I attended catechism, and and uh, so we were very in. You know, we played church basketball and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very very involved. And my parents, um, this is kind of a side note, <laughs> funny story is is my mom was friends with Tom Monahan, who was the founder of Domino's Pizza. Um, and she helped him get started. And my parents actually would run the pizza booth at the carnival at the church every year. Really? Wow. Yes. For Domino's. <laughs> for Domino's. Tom. Wow. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, we were very involved. I always had a faith in, um, in, in God, but but, you know, as all this trauma started piling on, especially after your, after my mother's murder, it, you start questioning, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, you can't even begin to fathom the depth of the prayers that you have when you're in those circumstances. And when they're not, when you're praying so desperately for resolution and it's not coming, you you start to, your faith wanes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Heavenly Father wasn't going to let that happen to me. My mom was like the mom extraordinaire. She, she never missed anything that my sister and I were in. And, and from the time I was six years old, I was in organized sports. Okay. So by the time I was 15, I, my sister and I both were playing in some sort of organized sports 12 months out of the year because wow. we played mm -hmm. for high school, basketball, volleyball, and softball. And we played for, um, 
and we played for a summer league softball team. So, and she worked full time. My dad worked afternoons by this time because um, this was the mid or the early 80s. In the early 80s, when CADs, you guys are going to laugh because when CAD systems first came out in the early 80s, they were so big and expensive. The auto companies um, ran them 24 hours a day. So my dad was a, a CAD designer for Ford. And so he had to work afternoon shift because um, they're running the CAD 24 hours a day. Um, my dad wasn't that involved, but my mom was. And so this was the first basketball game after my mom's funeral. Um, I remember it um, the same today as I did in 1985. <laughs> is I was at Plymouth Canton uh, High School, which nobody except for me knows where that is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I was a guard and I stole the ball and I was on this breakaway. The crowd starts cheering and I hear them and I, and I hear my mother <laughs> hmm. say, go Shelly, go Shelly. And so and I felt her. And so when I, I looked to just as I'm like shooting this ball, I, <laughs> and I saw her and this sensation just washed over my whole body. I knew it was her and she was there. She was in the stands. I brick the shot, the ball goes bouncing off. And then this piece like washes over me. And I hear her voice say to me, Shelly, I love you and everything will be okay. And then that it was gone. And then it was like, it was like everything was silent except for my mother's voice. Hmm. And, and so then the noise came back and I was back in the gym. I was, I was, I was always in the gym, but I was present again. And then the buzzer rang, we went into the locker room at halftime. I was convinced I was going insane so, so I didn't tell anybody about what happened. I just kind of thought, okay, well, um, I think that happened. I was struggling still. And, um, my mom was, uh, she always, she always dressed to the nines. So she always had matching handbags and shoes. So anyway, her favorite store, and I don't know if you remember this, if you, even if you're old enough to remember Baker's mm -hmm, is a mm -hmm. shoe store at the mall. And they used to have these sales and my mom loved sales because she's a product of the depression. And so, um, I'm in the mall, you know, it's the first Christmas that my mom's going to be gone and I'm by myself Christmas shopping. And I just, I was miserable. And I was walking past Baker's and I looked over and I swear I saw my mother standing in Baker's. So I had to walk around this bench and this planter in the middle of the mall. And I go into Baker's and I go into the store. Nobody is in there. And I mean, this is the height of Christmas shopping. I'm like, okay. So even the workers were in the back room and I could hear them talking and I'm just like, Okay, Shelly, I hope nobody saw you like detour your route to go into <laughs> Baker's and walk in and walk out with nothing. <laughs> so as I'm walking out, again, that sensation washed over me, the peace, I felt peace. And, and then I heard and I felt my mother's presence and I heard her voice, Shelly, don't worry, I love you and everything will be okay. Now, mind you, everything's falling apart. This is now December. I'd, I would, had been raped in July. I had told nobody. My mother was murdered in October. My dad has now moved us into my best friend growing up's house that's right behind the house that he burned down. He's sending me to get canned goods out of the basement. It's like going into a haunted house to the murder scene. That's a whole different story. Um, and then it, now it's December. I just, right after I had this, this second vision with my mom, I herniated two discs in my back and had to 
be bedridden for a month because of a back injury from volleyball. So, and now I'm having these reoccurring nightmares and I can't sleep and like another month or so goes by and, um, you know, everything is just getting worse and worse and worse. And mom has, you know, told me twice that every, she loves me and everything's going to be okay. And I'm sitting here thinking, how can she possibly be right? And so one night, and again, I still think I'm going crazy because, you know, I'm having, I've had, now I've had two of these, these experiences. Mm-hmm. So now I'm one night I'm laying in my bed. I'm like so miserable. I wanted to die. I was I was hadn't been sleeping for months. I'm just laying there. I'm just overcome with just this this immense sadness and grief and just overwhelmed with everything and and nothing was getting better. And, um, so as I'm laying there behind me, my room started to get light. Well, the door was behind me. So I thought, Hmm, maybe my sister, maybe Lisa's opening the door. So I rolled over. Well, when I rolled over, I saw this light growing in the light. My mom appeared. I could feel that light. I could feel the peace. I could feel her presence. And, um, and again, all she said to me was, Shelly, I love you and everything will be okay. And then that light closed up and she was gone again. And I, I was just like, okay, this is the third time this has happened. I, I really need to get, (laughs) figure out some psychiatric help or something. Yes. yes. <laughs> I really need to figure out what's going on here. Basically to answer my question, you felt that God was showing himself through your mother. And maybe you didn't, you didn't know this at the time, but to help maintain your faith, you were having these experiences with your mother, which You know, I, there, I'm sure there are some people listening who think "Ah, she saw her mother in Baker's or she, she was at the basketball game for reals. Yes. For reals. One of my favorite quotes from elder Holland, he says, don't underestimate your family on the other side of the veil. Oftentimes that is how uh, the Lord will work. It is through those who, who love us and who are deceased and so I love that you share that. And, and I hope that, that we can be believers in the reality of angelic ministration. And that is a gift of the spirit. And that is a gift of the restoration. You, at this time, you were not a member of the church, but it was coming. An introduction to the gospel was coming. And you were going to have an opportunity to understand that you weren't going crazy. <laughs> so would you um, tell us a little bit about your, your introduction to the gospel and who it was that shared that with you. That's a perfect segue because, because here I am, I now have seen an angel (laughs) twice, (laughs) felt her three times, heard her three times. And I knew that I wasn't crazy. And, and so, um, but I was trying to figure out, you know, I'm only 15 years old, so I'm trying to figure out how am I going to get the answer to this question of whether or not I'm, I I know I'm not crazy. I know this happened to me in July of 85, another miracle happened that I didn't know was a miracle until after a new mission president moved into the Detroit, Michigan mission and had a daughter who was 15 and tried out for the basketball team. And we became fast friends um, in August. I didn't even know what a Mormon was. All I know is I was still mad because in 1984, BYU beat University of Michigan in the Holiday Bowl. And I didn't know who (laughs) BYU was. (laughs) Sabrina and I became really fast friends. After everything fell apart and um, all this turmoil was happening, I practically became a fixture at the mission home because it was safe for me. I felt a different spirit there. I didn't know what it was that drew me there, but it it was something. And 
you know, Sabrina and I, normal teenage girls, we'd stay up talking late at night. We would talk about faith. Well, and we talked about boys too, but, (laughs) (laughs) but I started asking her questions because I was curious. I didn't know. I, all I knew is that she didn't drink. She didn't smoke. She didn't do all these different things. And she went to church for three hours, which I couldn't comprehend. <laughs> and, Those Mormons um, are truly crazy to go to church that long, right? Yeah, so I'm like, I'm like you, you mean you go voluntarily for three hours? And what are you talking about? 6 a.m. seminary. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Sabrina and I, started having these really long conversations. I just truly wanted to know what she believed um, and what was different. So I asked her, I said, well, what makes our faith different? I mean, I should have known, but I didn't know anything about her faith that I just, you know, was arrogant thinking, well, everyone knows about Catholics. So, (laughs) you know, uh, in my world, everyone was Catholic. I mean, there's other religions too. But I mean, that, that was in my area. She started to tell me the Joseph Smith story and I'm like, huh? So if I can have an angel appear to me in a, in a shiny white light, (laughs) why can't Joseph have an angel appear to him? And it just rang true to me. And the other thing that rang true to me too, was the doctrine about the Godhead. You know, she's like, you know, we believe that Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost are three individual beings. I'm like, yes, of course they are. You know, she's like, but you do know that's not what Catholics believe. (laughs) Yes, that's what she said to me. I'm like, yeah, I know, but that doesn't make sense. (laughs) And so, so Sabrina and I started talking and, um, she started inviting me to church and I came up with every excuse. They literally would leave me asleep in the mission home and go to church and come back and I'd have lunch with them. The following fall was um, Sabrina. uh, We had moved a couple times actually in that time period. And Sabrina gave me a book of Mormon. She had highlighted some passages in it. Moroni 10, 4 talked about the Moroni's promise with me. And she handed me this book and asked me, you know, basically for her testimony about how she knows that it's true, but that it was important that I have that witness for myself if I wanted it. So I took the book thinking, there's not a snowball's chance in Hades that I'm reading this thing because I'm dyslexic. And I hate reading. I put it in my nightstand drawer. I didn't want my sister or my dad to see it either. That's for sure. And it just kind of, it sat there. And then one night, again, I'm still struggling just because I'm not telling you the trauma that's going along in my mind when I'm going through this timeline. (laughs) All these other, all these things were happening. One night decided, okay, I'm going to pray about this book. I knew If I did, I intrinsically knew I was in trouble um, because everything that, because, but you got to remember that I'm a talker. So when I say Sabrina and I stayed up till all hours of the night, I'm talking two, three, four o'clock in the morning, we would be talking, poor Sabrina, but, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but um, everything she told me rang true. Everything she told me absolutely rang true to me. And so I was already having this internal battle of, well, I got my mom's faith. I, Mm. I, I I can't walk away from that. Mm. Surely I can't walk away from my mom's faith. That would be a betrayal (laughs) is Mm. how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. I curled up on the, on the couch in my room because my, at this point we had moved and I, my room was an entire loft. So I had a big space and um, I had a couch up there and I, I started reading. And right from the beginning, I, I knew, I, I knew it was true. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and so 
shortly thereafter, Sabrina, it, um, this was right before Christmas time now of my junior year of high school. And then I had this dream um, about a week later that um, Sabrina's family was gonna be leaving. And I was like, oh no. Well, the next day after that dream, we're, Sabrina and I are driving and she tells me, she says, Shelly, my dad um, is having some problems back at home with his business and um, we have to leave early. We're going home next month. Mm. And I was devastated because yeah. they'd become my safe haven. This is where I escaped because at this point I'm living with my dad, who's an alcoholic, drinking constantly every day. I'm trying to stay away from him as much as I possibly can. And now they're leaving and I'm like, oh. So the last Sunday that they were going to be in Michigan, they invited me to church. And it was the first Sunday of January, 1987. So first Sundays can be scary, everyone. <laughs> Every missionary is joy and nightmare to bring their <laughs> investigators to yeah. the testimony meeting. <laughs> so I go to church and it's testimony meeting, of course. You know, first I'm trying to figure out how everyone figured out I was visiting. <laughs> <laughs> Then it was this open mic thing. And I'm like, what is this? You know? <laughs> and Sabrina's entire family um, bore their testimony. Her brother, her both her parents, well, she did. And her brother did. And her dad did. And then her mom did. And her mom was at the pulpit. She looked at me. And when she looked at me, I could see my mother's face. Now, mind you, my mom is Scotch Irish Canadian, like um, Caucasian as Caucasian with blonde. And at that time, she had blonde hair. Okay. Sabrina's mom is Armenian. And she looked at me. And what she said was, Shelly, your mom is proud of what you're doing. And I knew it was my mom saying that to me that it was her approval of me attending church. Um, you know, and I felt the spirit wash over me when she said that. I knew it was my mother. I, it was the same sensation I had had those other times. It was just right. a different manifestation of that same thing. And so I knew that um, I had the approval. So at the end of church, <laughs> uh, one of Sabrina's uh, church friends who I was also I was more acquaintance with at the time, her name is Molly, came up to me and uh, she knew Sabrina was leaving. And so she says, she, we're just gathering in the lobby uh, before uh, uh, Sunday school. And she's like, okay. She's like, well, um, are you, you want to come to church with me next week? And I'm like, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't answer. She's like, okay, be at my house at eight 30. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so I started going to church and seminary with Molly every week and every day. And then, um, I was already friends with the APs because I had spent all the time at the mission home. So I requested that the APs come talk to me. Mm -hmm. And by February 15th, I was baptized. Wow. I love that, you know, Sabrina, she was your missionary and it almost seems like they were there for you. Oh, a hundred percent. I'll die testifying that President Parrott was called to the Detroit mission specifically for me. I will die, go to my grave testifying of that. I know that I ended up moving to California my senior year to live with them because mm. I, I couldn't, I couldn't contain the, the trauma that was going on around me and they took me in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love you know? that. I love that so much. What a family. Yeah. We all need a Sabrina in our lives, don't we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I've had many, and that's, mm. that's the other thing is is 
there's commensatory gifts. Yes. And, and, um, and we got to not lose sight of the commensatory gifts that you get. If you're faithful in um, moving forward through your adversity and you continue to move forward, um, what I've found is that I, there's never a point where Heavenly Father is not willing to give me a greater gift. I'm an engineer. And so there's equal and opposite forces in everything, right? And that's one of the principles of the gospel. One of the um, scriptures that always stood out to me that I grasped onto was the scripture that there must needs be opposition in all things. From that, I developed this, this concept of this balanced scale. And, you know, because I've, I've given these things a lot of thought because I've had a lot of time to, to think about adversity and its effect on you in your life. And um, you have the, this, the scales of justice and mercy. Heavenly Father promises us that he's, he's going to be just and he's going to be merciful, right? And, and, you're, and you're a parent. So um, he's our parent. And think about how you judge your children when they do something stupid. You're more willing to forgive them than anything else, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father says, okay, there needs to be this opposition in your life so you, you can learn and grow. But I promise you at some point, if I pile up in this hand on the scales and the scales are like this, and this is all the trauma and pain and suffering you've had in your life, at some point in your existence, an equal and opposite amount of joy, peace, happiness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, has to be placed on this side of the scale in order for God to be God. Hmm. There has to be balance. And, and even the laws of physics talk about equal and opposite forces. You, Heavenly Father works within the confines of the, uh, the universe and the laws of the universe. And so if you take a step back and you think about this principle of equal and opposite, that was a principle that I held on to that gave me hope because it's like, okay, well, if I am this miserable, I can trust that Heavenly Father is going to offset this misery at some point. So therefore, I can hang on and keep going. And, and so when I was at the bottom of the pit myself, that was the, that was the rope that I held on to to help pull myself out was this idea um, balance and mercy and justice and, you know, this equal, um, this equaling off of, of adversity. And that, that to me was a life-changing principle, but mm -hmm. it took me a long time to figure it out. I love that metaphor. And I believe that that is true. That is a true gospel principle that we can um, anticipate that one day, whether in this life or the next, that Christ will wipe away every tear and right every wrong that we experience in this life. That is what the prophets have promised us. And so I think for those of us, again, who are, are feeling like we may not be able to go on because of the level of trauma or difficulty that we are experiencing, I want you to hear Shelly and, and believe those words that um, we can trust in, in a savior who has the ability to succor and to heal things that cannot otherwise be healed by any other person or power, but he can. Now, um, we'd love to think that after you became a member of the church, that life was just dreamy and void of trials. Um, but <laughs> if you can believe it, Shelley continues through her adulthood to have a number of extreme adversities. <laughs> as people say. Uh, do you want to briefly share some of the, the challenges that you have faced in your adulthood and perhaps some of the ways that you've been able to cope to those? Sure. After losing my 
family, my home, and all my worldly possessions at 15. Um, the only thing I ever wanted after that was a family of my own. So I, I wanted to be married. I, I wanted six children. I wanted to have the white picket fence. You know, that's what, that's what everyone I think, or, or a lot of people dream about. And, um, and I wanted that, but I struggled. I graduated from BYU single and I moved back home. I actually broke off an engagement at BYU and it wasn't because he wasn't a great guy. It was because I wasn't ready because I hadn't healed from my trauma, but I didn't understand that yet. My trauma at this point now is impacting my, my life in a negative way, but I don't understand that it's impacting my life. I'm um, in my mid thirties. I own a, a home. I have my dream job and uh, you know, I'm, I'm making buku bucks because I, by this point, I'm 10 years into my career and, and I'm miserable praying to die every day. And um, because I hadn't resolved the trauma from my past, but mainly because I was single and now I'm like in my mid thirties, I'm trying to come to terms with heavenly father. Where are these guys to date? There's no one to date. I hadn't been on a date in years at this point. And, um, you know, you go to church every Sunday and you hear about forever families. And now I'm coming to term, try, trying to come to terms with the biological clock. And yeah. so that was a trial. And so finally, at 40 years old, I meet my husband. I get married a year later, a year and a half later. And nine days into my honeymoon, I get sick again. So sick <laughs> that <clears throat> within the first six months of marriage, I had. Well, actually, we got married in June, and then I was in the hospital for a week in August, and then in October, I was having a simple procedure for abdominal issue um, that almost killed me. I had to have an emergency surgery. I, I was supposed to be in and out in 24 hours. I, uh, I had sphincter of OD dysfunction, which is just some weird muscle by your biliary tree. It, it ha helps with the digestion and stuff. And I had already lost my gallbladder and I already had a few other issues. And anyway, long story short, this, this procedure that they did got infected. They didn't know it got infected. I almost, I literally was hours from death. They, the next day, uh, the next week, they operated on me again. They removed an abscess that this, size of a large orange, small grapefruit out of my abdomen, left an open wound in my abdomen, literally packed it with gauze, you know, like, oh. you know, you know, I'm a newlywed. Right. <laughs> I've waited, I've waited till I'm 41 years old to get married. And now I'm, my husband is sleeping in another room for me because I, uh, I come home from the hospital and I got tubes coming out of my body and I, you know, I got a wound back on a pole. And, wow. and so I'm home for, I'm home for like five days and I'm in excruciating pain and have to be rushed back to the hospital, almost die again. Um, my, what had happened is when they removed the um, abscess, they created some scar tissue and my stomach wasn't draining. So it was ready to rupture. So then they put another tube in my, to drain, to drain my stomach. So now I have a wound back and another tube in a bag and all this other stuff. I go home eight weeks. They try to figure out what's going on with my abdomen. And then they end up my first Christmas as a, as a newlywed, I spent in the hospital as they removed my stomach. And then I, the, the pain and nausea that I had before all of this, which was the in, ensuing problem became even worse because now I'm missing half of my internal organs. I'm, I'm missing my stomach, my gallbladder, the first two feet of my large intestines, my appendix, 
And one of those surgeries had herniated. So I have a mesh the size of a salad plate in my abdomen. And so now I am literally nauseous 24 hours a day and in pain in my abdomen 24 hours a day with, then I would eat. If I would eat, I would become so sick. I would be bedridden for hours. And, um, um, and then I'd have these fits of um, extreme pain. I did everything. I mean, I'm working with U of M. I mean, it's not like I was working with, you know, Podunk Ville Hospital. It, and and I, I remember walking out a, of the U of M, a, one of the, spe, the GI specialist office in tears. I went right to the cafeteria at the hospital at U of M and I called the Mayo Clinic. And I talked to them and I sent over my information. Do you know what they told me? You're getting the best help that you can have. Hmm. Keep going. So I got to the point where I was, um, I even tried partially digested feeding tube food to see if I could eat that and not get nauseous. And I still got nauseous and it was disgusting. So that was the only time I was um, pleased that I got nauseous. So when I say I did everything under the sun, I did everything under the sun. And um, to the point that uh, um, it was debilitating and I had to to go on disability and and retire from my career. (laughs) And, you know, I'm a newlywed. Right. So about two and a half years in of doing all this rigmarole, I just, I came to terms with, you know, and however many blessings I had and however many that this is just going to be how it's going to be for me for the rest of my life. I'm just going to be sick 24 hours a day and in pain 24 hours a day. And I'm going to have to be bedridden after I eat. And I actually started using um, medical marijuana before eating, which helped with the nausea I, um, to the point that I wasn't bedridden, but I still was, couldn't get up from the table for like two hours after eating. And so, so um, I came to terms with that and I was like, okay, you know, and when I went through my main Um, in my mid thirties, when I was depressed and, and wanting to die, I didn't talk about this yet, but I, I got, I, I found a trauma therapist finally that could help me at that time. And while I worked with the trauma therapist to dig up all these beautiful gems (laughs) and process them, um, I also worked on my spiritual growth because by that time I was so PO'd at Heavenly Father that I couldn't trust him. I didn't have enough trust in his plan for me. I, for 20 years at that point, I was taking care of myself and, Mm -hmm. and it was all up to me. And so, you know, and my dad betrayed me. My dad wasn't a father figure that you could emulate or look up to. So what example did I have? I didn't have one when I got done with, when I was working on the trauma therapy at the same time, I was, I was refocusing on my spiritual growth and learning how to apply the atonement. I read the book, Believing Christ. It's a very short read, but this is the thing that's, this was the thing that stood out the most for me. It was the idea that Everyone says that they believe, like they believe Christ, like they believe that Christ exists, that he was, that he was this person, right? That, that, that's talked about in the scriptures. But I think the hard concept is, is that we have a hard time believing in Christ's ability to heal us, Hmm. believing him believing yeah, yeah. in him, not that he exists, but believe him. So do I trust that what he's telling me is the truth that he can sucker me for all my infirmities? Do I have to understand how he does that? No, I don't. 
but I have to believe that he can. I had to change myself and allow myself to trust. And it was a slow process for me. It became a daily practice. I did a couple things in this time period. I, I focused on trying to learn how to trust. That was a new thing for me, you know, because again, I'm a child that grew up in this environment, right? Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. so trust was a hard thing for me. So I had to, even though I had faith and I believed in the scriptures and I believed and I had all these spiritual experiences, I needed to trust God. And, And so I worked on my, my trust issues, but at the same time, I changed the way I prayed. Now, I think this was a key, and I think it was, I'm terrible at remembering quotes. It could have been Faust. It could have been Maxwell. I'm not sure. One of them talked about how, um, you know, there's more um, fairness and adversity than you really think. And I think it was President Hinckley that talked about gratitude and having uh, um, a prayers of gratitude. And so... I decided, so I went from praying every day, oh, Heavenly Father, why, please send, you know, the knight in shining armor on the horse, you know, please, I need a date. Um, (laughs) Instead of, instead of praying for the things that I thought that I needed and wanted and didn't have, instead of complaining every night, (laughs) I changed my prayer my nightly prayer a hundred percent to this day is about gratitude. Mm -hmm. That's all I talk about at night with, with heavenly father, before I go to bed is what I'm grateful for. And I leave it at that by doing that simple thing. And again, it's an evolutionary process. It's not a light switch. It's something that's, that changes within you. It's this, it's this slow burn, if you will, of this changing of this light within you as you are focusing on all the gifts that you're given and all the immense blessings that we all have, regardless of who you are. You know, I, I learned that and back to, again, Faust or Maxwell about the, <laughs> about the um, equality and adversity all of that stuff is true, Tara. I mean, the, those cliches that you don't want to hear when you're in the thick of things of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, that's a true statement. You're not going to be given more than you can handle. Again, a true statement. Again, two things you don't want to hear when you're struggling, but they're both true. A lot of it is, is again, it's another thing that I learned that I didn't want to learn is that it becomes my choice. Am Mm -hmm. I going to make this a stepping stone or a stumbling block? That's my choice. Yes. The easy thing to do is to excuse ourselves from that choice and try to say, well, no, because so-and-so's action, that's making me feel this way. Well, my, and I would say that to my counselor constantly, especially when I was in my twenties, well, my dad did this. And so now I feel this way. And she'd say to me, well, no, you're choosing to feel that way. And I would get so mad because I'm like, what do you mean I'm choosing this? I'm not choosing this. This is my dad murdered my mother. How could I not be incensed? You know, right, right. but it becomes a choice. And, and um, we have to take ownership in our path of healing in our path of faith. It's believing in, um, in the promises that you're promised and you just keep going and you just keep going with um, this hope that, that there's going to be restitution. Again, that balanced scale, I kind of got off track a little bit. So I was sick for, for um, seven years and, but for five, five and a half years, I was completely okay emotionally and spiritually and um, mentally to just continue to endure because I, I'm going to admit I'm a weirdo because, (laughs) because I look at adversity now from my perspective is just another opportunity for growth. 
Mm. Okay. That's why I'm a weirdo because most people don't look at adversity as opportunities for growth, but I do because I've come to the realization that the whole plan and the whole purpose of, of us coming to earth is to be born, to be tried and tested. Right. Yeah. And so heavenly father is our parent. He's trying to teach us to be like Christ so that we have Christ like characteristics. Well, Hmm. How do you teach long suffering? You suffer long. <laughs> suffer long. How do you teach patience, endurance, empathy, charity, yeah. humility, all of these Christ like era attributes? That's the goal in life for each one of us to become as much like Christ as we can be. Well, we cannot get there without adversity because we wouldn't do the work required. Because Not because we're lazy, because it's the path of least resistance. It's the natural man, you know? Right. right. Uh, how do you teach your kids responsibility? You give them responsibilities. This is, Heavenly Father is teaching us. You can't compare your trials to somebody else's. What I've been through is what I've been through tailor-made for me based on my, um, my progression in the pre-existence and my characters and who Heavenly Father needs me to be. We're all uniquely different. He needs us all to be who we need to be, not who we thought we should be or who so-and-so thinks you should be. We need to become who Heavenly Father needs us to be. And he's going to give us the lessons required for us to become those people. Just because my adversity is different than somebody else's adversity, it doesn't make it harder or easier. And that goes back to what you were saying about the bumpy road thing earlier, is everybody's got a bumpy road. He loves us all exactly the same. So as a loving parent, what is he going to do? He's going to push every single one of us to our limit. So just because my limit is different than somebody else's doesn't make it easier or harder. It's just different. Right. And so, you know, I, I stopped asking the question why, you know, everyone, I, I figured out that the question why is the question that the adversary wants you to ask yourself. It's, it's this continuous do loop. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why? Well, stop asking the question. 100% of the time, the answer is because I needed to learn something. So what did I start doing instead of asking, why did this happen? I started asking what and how. What is it I'm supposed to be learning? And how do I use that knowledge to help myself and others? Because in my opinion, life is a team sport. We are here to help each other, you know, and that's why I'm doing the, the podcast. That's why I wrote my memoir, because I want people to know that you can go through trauma after trauma, after trauma, after trauma, and it still be okay. And so after all these years of, of um, being sick, I was praying one morning and my mom came to me again. She says, Shelly, it's time for you to get a blessing of healing. And I'm like, okay, but I've had like 50,000 blessings. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she's like, and she basically, she told me that I needed to pray about who was to help my husband. Basically, like you know, go wash in the river Jordan seven times right. kind of list of things to do to prepare myself. Um, cause one of the things is, uh, that I was told, cause I've had several experiences with my mother that I haven't shared, but, uh, I'll tell you this much is, is my dyed in the wool Catholic mother has come to tell me that I need to study about Spiritual gifts in Doctrine and Covenants 46. It's something that, you know, we can pray and ask for those gifts. 
And it's something that Heavenly Father wants us to do. And he wants to bless us with those gifts. When I was a freshman at, at BYU, um, I got a blessing from my bishop that said, in, in the blessing from my bishop, I was told that because of what I've been through and how I've chosen to handle it, the veil will be thin for me throughout my life. Well, this was after I had had those experiences with my mother. So I knew, I finally mm. knew, and I'm like, oh, that's what I'm talking about. A, a commensatory uh, gift is I've had that gift throughout my life. When I did my mom's temple work, she was there when, you know, I've had many things. So my mom coming to me to tell me to get a blessing was not that unusual for me. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I loved Elder Holland's talk about ministering angels because I'm like, yes, because no one talks about it, but it happens, you guys. It yeah. does happen. And so I'm I'm sticking my neck out to, here to, to be a witness to say it's happened to me. So I pray about this blessing. One of the things I was supposed to do before the blessing was fast. And um, and so I I I fasted the day of the blessing and I had to travel to um, get the blessing from the person that was supposed to help my husband that I felt most comfortable with. And so, so we traveled to, um, to get the, the blessing. And so I had fasted that day and there was a little confusion of whether my friend and his wife were going to um, break the fast with them or if we were going to break it together. And so me being brilliant decided, well, because whenever I would fast, I would get more nauseous after not eating at all, all day than mm -hmm. I did. And, I, you know, I am so brilliant. I decided I'm going to break my fast at Cafe Rio because we don't <laughs> have Cafe Rio in Detroit. <laughs> so, That'll do a number on anybody's stomach, healthy or not. <laughs> yes. So, so I do my, uh, I do my medical marijuana before Cafe Rio in Orem. I go in there and I have half of my burrito and I am so sick. I can't even move for two hours. I barely make it to the car and we drive over to our friend's house and um, we chit chat a little bit. And, and so now it's time for my blessing and I'm still nauseated from Cafe Rio because of my brilliance. <laughs> and, um, and so Literally, Kevin and um, Glenn, as soon as they anointed, as soon as they put the oil and in their hands on my head and started anointing my head, there was this sensation. I, I don't know how to describe it. Just this sensation. Just it started at the top of my hand uh, from their hands. It washed down my entire body. And I literally could feel the nausea get pushed out my feet and it was gone, <laughs> like gone, gone. Wow. To, and so was the pain that I had the 24 hour a day pain and nausea gone. We leave, we leave their house. We're on our way back to the hotel. I, I stop. Uh, I'm like, let's get a pastry. Cause sweets was like the worst thing for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I wanted to try out my newfound uh, luck. <laughs> See if this was a legit miracle or not. Yeah. I wanted to <laughs> test my miracle. <laughs> so, so I had this pastry scarf that down fine. And in the blessing, it was, I was told that the reason for this healing was so I would have the capacity to do my book. This miracle healing is, is in the book. It's, it made the book. It's the mm -hmm. ending really. I don't get to share the, that story with many people because again, most people think I'm off my rocker, but I'm not. And everything was going great for me until I got COVID. And now I'm a long hauler and all of my nausea and pain and all that has come back with a vengeance, but mm. We'll see what happens with that. But, you know, again, I'm okay. I'm literally sick every day again. Actually, I'm sicker now than I was before. I get, um, 
I have pain all over my body. I have constant nausea. I, I, I can hardly eat anything. I have brain fog. I have all these symptoms. You know what? It's okay. I would be remiss if I didn't make this statement. I can honestly tell you, I would not change anything about my life because of the value of the lessons that I've learned. I have empathy, but I've never come across somebody that I couldn't relate to in some way. I mean, like my husband's divorce, you know, his divorce crushed him. Um, but I could relate to that pain because of my own experiences in a different thing. I have all these, these commensatory gifts that I've received that I'm grateful for. My faith in the plan of salvation is knowledge now. Can you debate whether Adam had a belly button or not? Sure. Can you debate all, can you debate trivial things that don't matter? Sure, go ahead. But the truth of the matter is, Joseph Smith is a prophet. He saw Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. He restored the gospel. If that happened, and if the Book of Mormon is true, then you don't need to question every minute little detail. Yeah. Because it's just noise. Don't let the noise of the world distract you from the truth. And the truth is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has the power to heal you from any affirmity, any anything. And Heavenly Father has a divine plan for each one of us. And he, his hand is in the details of your life, whether you know it or not. Again, I can honestly say, Yes, it's been a long road. Yes, it's been hard. Yes, I've shed tears. Yes, I've been angry. Yes, I've been frustrated. But you know what? I've learned and learned and learned. And now I have a character of a person that I wouldn't have been able to become. So incredible. I've really, I've, I've been tearing up and really trying very hard not to cry. (laughs) Um, I wish that my listeners could see you testify. I know you said you were weird, Shelly, but I believe that you are just becoming more and more refined. You are becoming a saint. And that is what our father in heaven and our mother in heaven and our savior, that is what their goal is for each of us. I believe that as we reframe our adversity, we recognize that we do have a choice, that we can choose to make it, as Shelley said, a stumbling block or a stepping stone, that our attitude towards our experiences is what will make or break us, not the experience itself. And as we believe Christ and believe that he can heal us from all our infirmities, again, whether that be today, tomorrow, or in the next life, we can have hope in his mercy and in his love and his ability to, to make us whole. So thank you so much, Shelly. This has been truly a gift for me. And I believe it will be so much of a gift to our listeners who I know there will be at least one person who desperately needed to hear this message. So you've probably already answered this question, but we always end with this final question. Um, Why are you still rowing and choosing faith in Christ and his restored church? I am still rowing because I know that that plan that I signed up for, that I know I signed up for in the pre-existence, and that I know that I had a glimmer of an understanding of the whole scope of what I was going to be doing here. That is a true principle. I know that to be true. There is nothing that will get me to deviate from following the savior. I'm going to ruin the ending of the book, but I think this is (laughs) apropos. 
it says, it remains beyond my understanding why God blesses me so abundantly. Although my mother's words carried me through the smoking ruins of my early life, a scripture from 1 John carries me now. We love him because he first loved us. Along the way, I questioned God's faithfulness and lost my own. Hopelessness assaulted me while I crouched under a frozen pine tree. When I lay torn apart in a fallow field, as I peered down from a Mexican rooftop, despite my anger at him, God redirected Sabrina's family to Detroit, allowed my mother to enlighten my darkest hours, and provided friends and a new family to love me when my own couldn't. God's presence guided every step from my first stumbling prayer in the loft to Glenn's words of abiding love. Most importantly, God allowed me to lose everything in fiery trials so he could restore my soul from the ashes. He healed my body to make sharing his love easier. I cannot help but adore him. He loved me first. My final wish is that my message reaches the bruised and heavy hearts of my fellow survivors. You are loved and everything will be okay. Even ashes can be made beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you for your, your time and your testimony. And this book will be available when? April 6th, my birthday. Awesome. <laughs> That will be a good day. I will put a link in my show notes for your website. You are a rock star. Thanks. Appreciate your time and testimony tonight.